Um, uh, so I'll uh, formally introduce uh, Professor Goddard. Uh, uh, Goddard has been a pioneer in developing methods for quantum mechanics, force fields, reaction dynamics, molecular dynamics, complete sampling prediction of protein ligand system. And uh, he has used these methods for numerous applications to catalysis, fuel cells, batteries, membrane proteins, drug design. The primary goal is to optimize performance computationally, so experimental validations can be rest restricted to a predicted best system. So more on his uh, uh, professional training. Uh, Bill did his uh, PhD from Caltech uh, in 1964 uh, with a minor in physics. Uh, PhD was in engineering science. And starting 1984, uh, he has been a professor there at Caltech uh, for last uh, 40 years. <coughs> and uh, he has uh, been phenomenally productive in all those areas I have already mentioned. He has a total publications, uh, more than 1,500 publications with an age index of 180. And he has uh, 27 patents and 15 pending. Uh, he has been cited uh, heavily, and so he's one of the most highly cited researcher for last almost several years. And uh, among his awards and honors, it's numerous. I will just mention a few. So he has been elected member to the National Academy of Science in 1984. He has been electing member of International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science, 1986, American Physical Society, 1988. He is also the elected fellow of American Advancement of Science, and he has several honorary uh, degrees from around the world. And uh, he has come to ISC as ISC DST Centenary Professorship uh, uh, in 2015 for two weeks, so we are very fortunate to have him there. Um, uh, he recently has been named uh, uh, 17th international best uh, uh, chemist uh, and uh, in USA 12th best chemist uh, by uh, a research uh, ID organization. Uh, so I don't think I will take much more time. So Bill, we look forward to your exciting talks. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. So um, yeah, I want to talk today about uh, some of the work we've done on uh, on. Um, Biological systems, uh, particularly on uh, G protein coupled receptors. These are the receptors you want to uh, agonize to relieve pain, to give pleasure. Um, we have projects in a number of areas. And I'm going to give four examples uh, where we've had collaborations to test our predictions, and we've done several cycles of some of them to get more and more effective uh, drugs. So, um, just a little background, because I understood this is a public lecture, so you might not all have the same background. Um, we're dealing with proteins. People talk about the structure of proteins as a primary sequence, and then it organizes itself into different kinds of structures, like a, an alpha helix. Then the, those things get organized into overall structure called tertiary structure, and then it's quaternary structure organizing a system. So myoglobin would be considered to have a tertiary structure, hemoglobin, Four myoglobins together would be tertiary, quaternary structure. So uh, we're going to be talking about membrane proteins today. And so in particular, the membranes, of, membrane proteins we're going to talk about are called G protein coupled receptors. Uh, one protein goes to the membrane seven times, and they pack sort of closest packed together those seven helices. They couple to a G protein, and when a ligand comes up, like say morphine, it causes this G protein to open up. It releases a GDP that gets uh, interchanged with GTP and it relieves your pain. Um, and so, so we're interested in that process. So, uh, but just a little bit of background. Um, so we, the genetic code, um, there are 64 codons that code for 20 amino acids, uh, three of which don't code for anything, so they're stop codons. Um, and, uh, there's different kinds of structures. The primary sequence, uh, the protein may have uh, basically that primary sequence, sometimes some bonds between cysteines. Uh, there's a peptide bond, so uh, amino acid A, say a lysine, may be connected to another amino acid, say alanine, through a carbonyl and an NH. These will generally be trans and planar. Uh, the important angles are rotations about the the C alpha position, the psi, the phi and psi, that sort of determines how the protein uh, tw twists. Um, the proteins are classified sometimes in different groups, the so hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and amphoteric. Um, 
So again, I mentioned their secondary structure. The one I'm going to particularly be interested in is the alpha helical structure um, that repeats every four amino acids. Um, so in the structure of the cell, we have receptors in the membrane. For example, GPCRs is one of the membrane proteins. It's coupled with a GU protein. Ligand binding, say morphine, uh, to the outside, causes uh, some signaling to occur, the GDP, GTP, uh, beta rest, and lots of things to go on. Um, and um, so, so again, a, a receptor, a, a ligand, say morphine, can bind to the outside. Uh, when it does that, it causes a G protein inside to open it up and release um, uh, protein. It, gets, it basically releases the pain. Um, so in the membrane, uh, the membrane is somewhat uh, uh, flexible. Uh, it's affected by having cholesterol and things bound to it. Um, a lot of properties that are important. Um, so we've been, and ones we're going to be interested in are bilayers like this. And they have pieces. These pieces here are made up of things that look like this, lipid molecules. Um, and so, so again, we're looking at transmembrane proteins. There are two class, two main classes. One's alpha helical structures, the GPCRs. Beta sheet structures are good for transporting real molecules to the cell. The G proteins don't transfer a molecule through the cell. The molecule binds in the inside, causes something to happen in the inside. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so. So here's, here's a schematic of the structure. So it's very hydrophobic in the middle, uh, right where the ends of the protein are. So the seven transmem transmembrane helices, where the, the loops are, the three loops on the outside, three loops on the inside, it's sort of a little more polar. Um, and then, of course, you have water, salt, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so here's a, here's a picture of one. Um, so the G protein, GPCR. The transmembrane pieces, it's in, it's in the membrane here. It's now attached to a G protein, the three segments of the G protein, alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha holds in this GDP tightly coupled. Nothing happens to it until the ligand comes in and opens it up to do the signaling. Uh, involved with lots of kinds of signaling. Uh, all the senses, uh, smell, taste, pain, vision, all rely on GPCRs. Um, neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, um, about right now, about half the uh, drug targets are, f are to the GPCRs, uh, 180 billion a year a few years ago. Here's another schematic. So sometimes it's shown like this as seven helices, but this is what it really looks like. And here's this G protein in the mid and the in and inside of it, the alpha, beta, gamma, um, and different stag stages of the system. The G alpha opens up, releases this GDP for signaling. Um, so. Um, yeah, so the important thing with GPCRs is uh, it activates. So a ligand comes in, it activates, it causes signaling. But, but no one has known what the mechanism is by that which that works. And so we're going to talk today about that mechanism. We figured it out. Um, and so, um, so it's just discovered or published this year. Um, so there are uh, lots of G uh, GPCRs I mentioned. Um, We'll talk about some of the classes. Um, it's not important to know, but there's roughly four, 834. Um, there are structures now for about 67 of them. Uh, there's no structure for any of the 400 OFAC receptors. There's no structure, or maybe now just one, for the taste receptors. Very, it's been very hard to get structures for these systems. So that means that there's really a need to be able to predict structures. Um, and so. Um, because I mean, we have 67, but I've done, most of the time we, we want to deal with the structure, it's not known experimentally. So, um, so you can use, for non-membrane proteins, you can use homology pretty successfully. There's a couple hundred thousand structures of proteins that are not in membranes. And if you get a homology, uh, let's say maybe 40% or more, you can get a very accurate structure. But the problem with GPCRs is that Homologies are generally very small, uh, much less than the, the needed to get a, a reliable structure. Worse than that, if you take the, the known structure, take its sequence, and then mutate that sequence to the target sequence, there are bad contexts. So these helices then rotate and, and twist. Um, and so, so it's not, so homology methods don't actually work very well. Um, so 
we want to predict structures. Um, and so the question is how we do it. So we don't use molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics, if you start with a structure, uh, it take maybe many microseconds or milliseconds for that structure just to shift um, around the, 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 the various proteins. It's way too slow. We don't use Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo, in principle, you could sample all the structures. But any simple way of doing it, you get impossible numbers of structures that you have to control. And it's really important to make sure you've looked at all the structures, I think. Um, so we developed a way to look at all the structures. For the GPCRs, we consider that um, 1.3 trillion structures actually covers all the useful structures. Um, and so but the question, question is, how can, we, how can we select the winners? We don't have structures to compare with, so how do we know we've got the right answer? So, so we use energies. Generally speaking, theorists in this business don't really trust the total energies. They're not that reliable. Um, but uh, we, use, we use a particular way of evaluating energies that we think is reliable enough. We're trying to make it more reliable. So, so here's the idea. So I'm going to give a talk on next Monday with more detail uh, about it. This talk is meant to be a broader sc a scope uh, of, of, that might be intelligible to a broad group of people. But fundamentally, there's seven helices that go through the membrane. For each of these helices, we can talk about the rotation about the axis, the tilting from the vertical axis, and the azimuth angle of that tilt. So, um, so it, the angles are uh, uh, theta, phi, and eta. And what we found is that if we sample starting with a no known structure, so we have a known structure, even from theory experiment, we know what the tilt angles and rotation angles are. We start from that, and then we make mutation to our target, the one thing we're trying to predict. And if we change the, the, the theta angle by plus or minus 10 degrees, and the rotation by plus or minus 15 or 30 degrees, um, and the, uh, as the, the, the um, as a muscle angle by 15, 30 degrees. If we just do those 13 trillion structures, we think we can uh, capture all the possible structures. All we have to do is predict which one or ones are stable. We use our energies for that. Um, so, um, so now we do it in a fast way. I mean, 13 trillion is a lot of structures to evaluate. So there are 12 interacting, 12, 12 interact, interacting helices that are important. You have one more or less in the center that interacts with all six, and then you have the ones on the edge, six more interactions. So there are 12 pairs of interactions. Because the tilts change, it gets a little complicated, uh, and I'm not going to go into those details, but we go through these pairwise interactions to predict the energy for all 13 trillion, and then we take the best 1,000 of those 13. We use what's meant to be called a mean field approach. That is, each one of these pair of helices we optimize the side chains, how they interact. Um, but uh, the, the same helix might interact with another one and might have different interactions. So we evaluate all 13 trillion using the sort of mean field approach. And then we reduce it down to the best one or 2,000. We build them into seven helix bundles. We again, re-optimize the side chains um, to get the final structures. And what we found is that uh, using this approach, uh, that if we start with a known structure, uh, and, 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 and try to predict that structure using these 13 trillion, essentially always number one structure is the known structure, either the theory or experimental structure. Uh, we don't just end up with one structure, however, because different ligands may like different combinations of these helices. So rotating these helices around and tilting them can change the binding site. Different ligands may have different needs in terms of the binding site. What we found is we take the best 25, um, that pretty well samples the space, so the, the energy space and the configuration space. So again, I'll talk more about detail on, on next Monday about that. Here's an example um, that, in this case, we um, um, again did the 13 trillion, reduced it down to the 1,000. And then um, in this case, uh, the, the, the best 10 structures all have a RMS deviations of something like uh, um, Less than an angstrom, I can't see it here. Um, and so, and, and number one is the experimental structure. So, so that, what that says is the way we evaluate the energy is good enough to be able to recognize the best structure, and the way we 
partition the side chains. We have a procedure we call SCREAM, which is optimized to find the best pairs of orientations of side chains that interact with each other. And that says that that's good enough to work. Um, now, uh, one of the points was, I mentioned we're gonna, we're gonna keep the best 25, and typically, if we start with an inactive structure and predict uh, the various uh, structures from that system, and then we bind uh, agonists to it, the agonists generally don't bind to the lowest energy structure. So for example, for adenosine, um, the all four uh, good, strong agonists bind to structure number 15 of our 25, and the best agonists antagonists bind to number two. No one likes the best one. Um, so, so that's why we do 25. Now, I said that uh, we don't use molecular dynamics to predict it. We don't use Monte Carlo to predict things. But when we made our prediction, those predictions didn't have the membrane. To do 13 trillion structures, we can't, we can't put in the solvent and the membrane. We try to estimate it in effect some way. But when we predicted the final structure for the protein, um, these 25 cases, and we predicted the binding site for the ligands, um, um, then we take that final assembly, uh, ligand plus protein, we put it in a uh, 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 the lipid bilayer, we put in the solvent, the right salt, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes we put in cholesterol, things like that. And then we do dynamics. And if we've made a mistake, uh, even in two nanoseconds of dynamics, we'll, find that we'll start losing the good interactions. Uh, generally speaking, if it's a good structure, we'll find new interactions when you do the dynamics. Water will come in, bridge between some of the amino acids to get an improved bonding. So we don't use microdynamics to predict it, we use microdynamics to validate our structure. Most of the time, there will not be an experimental validation. So I talked about getting the structure. The second thing that's really important is figure out where the ligands want to bind. Uh, where does morphine bind, for example? Um, so we have a procedure we call Darwin Doc. Um, and um, it's, um, uh, I'll go through the details of it um, in a minute. But so we use that procedure and we dock to all 25 of these structures we just predicted. Because we don't know which one the ligand may like best. Um, and then a typical ligand uh, has rotational degrees of freedom. So we'll go through and we'll predict the best 10 or 15 conformations of the ligand. We'll dock each one of those 10 or 15 each one of these 25 um, protein structures, and then we'll compare all of them, compare the energies of all of these, so 15 times 25, 400 or so, and then we look carefully at the best 10 or 20 structures that come from that. Um, so the um, procedure uh, we call Darwin Doc. So the way Darwin Doc works is that um, we, for a typical protein, We'll sample maybe 5,000 poses. Uh, without doing energies, 5,000 poses. We'll collect together those 5,000 poses into families based on their armist uh, deviations from each other, so about 2,000 families. We then take the family heads and do a binding of the family head to the binding site. And then we take the best 10% of those families and do the daughters. Um, and so we think that that optimizes the sampling of the system. All that work we do with four of the renal acids replaced by alanines. So the four big hydrophobic ones replace the alanines, there's lots of room. Then this procedure, the 5,000, the 50,000 structures, uh, we do iteratively by 5,000 at a time. We group it into families until we st stop getting new families. Um, and then we take the best 100 structures by energy, um, and then for those best 500, we replace these alanines back with original amino acids. That means every one of our 100 has a different set of side chains. So the key problem with docking is you need to know where the side chains are to know where to dock the ligand. You need to know where the ligand is to find out where the side chains are. So this is how we solve this chicken egg problem. Um, and so, um, so it works pretty well. Uh, we've done lots of tests on it. Uh, we, when we do a test, we don't take the side chain position for crystal structure. We use our procedures to predict the, the side chains. Um, but we generally get better than two angstrom resolution of, of the uh, ligand binding site. So uh, now, so yeah, so I said, what we really want to know is how it activates. Right now, there are about um, maybe 
uh, 25 or 30 GPCRs with G protein, with ligand, already activated. And there are another 40 or so of GPCRs, sometimes with G protein, that are not activated. But no one has a structure in between that leads to the activation. It's either inactive or it's fully activated. What's going on in between that actually leads to the activation? So, um, so we know what that is. Um, there's also a second kind of signaling I won't talk much about. Besides the G protein signaling, there's also what's called beta arrested signaling. For pain, uh, morphine can lead to the uh, G protein signaling that relieves the pain, but it also leads to beta arrested that causes side effects. So very often, you'd like to have a bias ligand that only does the G protein, but not the beta arrested, or vice versa. So here's the, here's the mechanism. Here's how it works. So you have the inactive G protein, GPCR. The ligand comes up and binds to it. Now, often, that original inactive GPCR on the intracellular region has a salt bridge. For example, a glutamic acid with an arginine. And that holds it sort of inactive. And so, so the, the G protein comes up. Uh, the G alpha, the C terminus, the G alpha is negative. That negative goes in, binds the positive part of that uh, salt bridge, opens up, and then the, the uh, alpha helix of the, of the G protein, what's called alpha 5, it gets inserted uh, in, in partially into the membrane. So that pre-coupling, the G protein opens up the salt bridge to allow it to get in there, and then it nestles into a nice, comfortable configuration, but the GDP is still held tightly by the G alpha. And so it waits patiently for the ligand to come up, and if the ligand binds in the right place, the ligand can cause this G alpha to open up and release the GDP to do the signaling. So, um, so that's the final structure. This has been observed experimentally 25 or, or 30 cases or so. This has been observed experimentally 40 cases. No one's seen these experimentally. We have structures now for about 25 cases. Um, so the key in starting was a couple of years ago, a cryo-EM structure was done uh, with OK resolution, 3.2 angstroms, and they were able to capture the G protein bound to the GPCR. So protein-protein docking, that's not so easy computationally. This is really important. Um, now, that structure was missing 133 res uh, residues and, 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 and missing key parts of, of five others. So, but you can see it, it gave an overall kind of structure. So what we did was use computational techniques, metadynamics. Um, so, so metadynamics, the form of doing molecular dynamics, it's good for going over barriers. That is that we drive the system to go, for, to go over barriers much more often than we would thermally. And so, um, and so this is the final structure. This is the initial structure. This is the final structure. So we maintain the parts of the initial structure then we predict the rest of the residues and how they interact. What we discovered was that there were 12 salt bridges that couple this G protein to the intracellular helices of the GPCR. Seven, seven helices went through the intracellular region three times. It turns out there were salt bridges between the G protein and these intracellular loops, there are, uh, 12 salt bridges. They were missed with the resolution of the, of the cryo-EM. They couldn't see that parts of it. They always, almost always, there's too much disorder in, in the way the salt bridges form to see them at that level of resolution. And so, so that, that, was, that was a key clue forward, is that you make these salt bridges, and then these three salt bridges, um, um, they, um, well, okay, so yeah, well, this is just an example of one of them showing the energetics. This is for metadynamics, that bringing up the G protein to the inactive G protein to the inactive GPCR and letting them interact, the C alpha, the, the, the C terminus of the G alpha came in, broke the salt bridge, and started inserting alpha 5 into the membrane. Um, uh, but it doesn't activate. So this is just in the metadynamics to get those energetics. Um, so we, we did this first for the opioid receptor and submitted a paper to Nature Catalysis. Um, and, um, and it got, you know, went back and forth for a year, Nature Catalysis. 
Um, and the bottom line was the reviewers weren't happy because there's no experiments. And so, yeah, maybe they're going to be experiments someday, but they were not yet. And so even though we had proved it for one case, they didn't think it was general. So then we went back and did 15 cases with six different G proteins, and they all worked the same way, and that got published. Um, so, um, and this is an example of what came out of, of doing this, that uh, once we made the, made the G protein GPCR complex, now we can look at binding of the ligand to that complex and see what, what, what are the energetics for opening it up. So starting with the G protein GPCR complex, in this case we bonded an agonist to it, and for a good agonist, uh, there's a small barrier to go over to open it up, and a big delta G for opening it. Um, there's also what are known as partial agonists. It's never been quite clear what a partial agonist is, how it's different from a full agonist. Turns out the big difference is partial agonists have a big barrier and a small delta G, so you actually get a population of the agonist bound that activates and another population that doesn't, whereas the full agonist, basically all the population activates. And then what's called an inverse agonist that blocks activity, that has a big delta G the wrong direction. It doesn't want to open up. Um, and um, so, um, so the, um, and this is just an example of a, another one, the myopia receptor and the overall energetics that the, um, that the um, G, G protein um, um, uh, is driven to, um, this, this is a precoupled complex, and it's, uh, uh, the energetics are opening it up. So, so the overall picture then for G protein coupled receptors is an inactive receptor. G protein comes up, uh, it, it opens up the salt bridge, um, and and it moves into the, into the receptor partway, and then it and then it stops. It's not activated yet. The ligand binds. It opens up this G alpha and releases the the GDP to get the binding structure. So again, we can compare the final structured experiment, initial structured experiment. There are not yet structures for these, although I think there will probably be some in a couple of years. Um, so what I want to do today is talk about four cases where we've used theory, conjunction experiment, to develop better drugs. Uh, on Monday, I'm going to talk much more of detail about GPCRs and what we've learned about them. But um, it's really important uh, that the theory connect the experiment to improve what's been known experimentally. So we have four examples I want to talk about. Uh, one of them has to do with a cancer project with City of Hope. Um, and um, in that system, we've now made a new ligand from the theory that's 100, now it's tested experimentally, it's 190 times better than the best previous drug from experiment. Um, another cancer project with City of Hope where, where um, I'm ready to breast cancer, where again, we've, we've gotten something that's at least twice as good as the best previous one in the market. Um, a target for, for asthma, um, I'll talk about uh, where we are there. And we think we have, uh, we've designed 847 new ligands that should be better than the best previous one for, for activating, uh, activating the, the taste receptor for asthma. And then on the pain, um, we have um, uh, some, some new drugs came out of the theory, tested experimentally, that have are biased, so they, do, they relieve pain without the side effects. <clears throat> so the first project, um, the target, <clears throat> the City of Hope, is what's called the PARGE tar target. And so basically, <clears throat> you, wanna, you wanna block this PARGE activity so that when you have single strand breaks, uh, you basically uh, get cell death, so that it doesn't survive. But in, in cancers, they actually block this activity so that these uh, single breaks do not get, uh, uh, they, get uh, they get repaired by the cancer, so they survive. Um, and so, um, so in this case, um, the thing I'm going to talk about today, we've done several projects related to this, but the one I'm going to talk about is that uh, City Hope developed a breakthrough drug. Uh, by doing lots of experiments, they found a drug that actually uh, was good enough to start doing uh, 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 MOS studies on it. And so, so we started with their drug, and then we tried to improve it, and we now have one that's, uh, I think it's 190 times better. So, and so what we do here is, since we already have a scaffold, a background to this drug, 
we have some things that are exposed, and then um, uh, we take various things on the outside, and then we go through a bunch of replacements. So this R1 side here, we might replace that by 20 or 20, 30 different possible uh, uh, ligands. Uh, R2, uh, uh, 20, 10, 20 or 30 ligands. And then we do computations to optimize those systems. And then we take the best two or three or four or five from the theory. And then City of Hope has a synthetic person that can synthesize the molecules and test them. That's what we've done. So our first round, we had several that City of Hope has suggested that we test. Um, and we found three of them that worked doing uh, uh, further. And we found some from, from, from uh, Caltech. And so, so they did those systems. And they found that one of our new compounds that we had suggested had twice the inhib inhibition of their best current drug. Uh, and so then um, we did a second round. So now starting with this uh, information that, um, that this uh, PARG3 uh, was twice as good as the best current uh, drug, we then modified PARG3 with, again, a, a bunch of, of modifications on the outside of it. We <clears throat> predicted a bunch of new compounds that I think we had uh, uh, probably these six. <clears throat> we had six that got tested. And, um, and what happened is that now the, the, the binding is basically 190 times better, 160 times better than the, the best from the previous drugs. So we're now going through a third round. This is actually good enough to do new experiments on mice. We're going to do a third round uh, to try to improve it further. Um, and we have two very promising candidates that by our prediction should be really, really great inhibitors. Um, so, uh, and again, we just, we use two positions, many choices for one of the positions, a few for the others. So again, by going back and forth between the theory and experiment, uh, we can see how we did in the previous predictions, what are some of the flexibilities available, um, and then uh, going forward. The second, uh, Topics also related to cancer, um, and it's, it's, uh, there's a, to get uh, twist inhibitors that can block, um, that, that can uh, pr prevent uh, breast cancer. And so again, there's been lot, many studies of this. Um, uh, in these studies, um, uh, City of Hope developed um, a new class of inhibitors uh, called the harming class that are effective enough um, it would be useful, but not quite, quite good enough to, for, a real, for, for a final solution. So, so given that we knew how strong these fat bound fat to, it, to the system, we made a model for the structure that they, the site they bind to. There are certain hints up about that structure in terms of what amino acids are relevant. Um, should be in here. Uh, anyway, so, and what we found is that the there's a reasonably good correlation between our predicted binding and the measured binding constants. So that gave us some confidence that our binding site might be OK. And then we use that binding site to predict, um, um, uh, go through in silico screening. So we went through, uh, I think, 12,000 molecules that were drug-like molecules and to bind to this site. And we picked the. Um, Basically, from our predicted binding site of harmine, we developed a pharmacophore model. That is, a, we, there were good hydrogen bonds to these places, aromatic groups here, hydrophobic groups here. And then we went through the 12,000 molecules to find molecules in the database that match all five of these requirements. Um, and so, um, so the 12,000 down to 1,400. And there we use other people's software. Um, Schrodinger has a pretty good in circle software. It's good for eliminating lots of bad cases, but it's not good for finding the winner. And then we use our, our methods for doing the, the Darwin doc uh, evaluation and, and getting the winners. And so, so this led to 10 cases we thought they should order. Um, they ordered eight, and they tested six. Um, and so of those six, in fact, one of them was almost as good as their best current drug. So, so we went from. 14,000, 11,000, uh, 12, 10 predicted, uh, 8 ordered, 6 tatted, 1 was almost as good. So then we went to a second round um, uh, based on that, and we found uh, 
several that were, were, were pretty promising and, and did experiments on those several. Um, and then uh, 20 of them were better than the, than the, the previous one we had predicted. Um, and, um, uh, and one of the predicted ones, basically, uh, you, you, you want to keep this uh, site open. Uh, Twist keeps it open, uh, Harmine keeps it open to 50%, ours is 93. So it's at least a factor of two better in terms of acting on the system. So, um, so uh, yeah, so it's just sort of the experiments done on our new predicted molecule is much better than the previous one. Um, and so um, the third target has to do with asthma. Um, so uh, asthma, is a beta 2 uh, uh, GPCR is, is uh, adrenergic receptors is, uh, is it can be dealt with by drugs, but some people can't tolerate the drugs, and some it doesn't work for. We'd like to have new targets for asthma. Our collaborator in Florida, Steve Liggett, um, is focused on asthma, and he identified a taste receptor. So taste receptors are in your tongue, presumably so you don't eat better stuff that are bad, that could be poisonous. But taste receptors are in your heart, they're in your lungs, they're in your GI tract. Every cell in your body, the brain, has taste receptors. Basically, no one knows what they're doing. But it's known that they're associated with diseases. Uh, most of these organs have more than one taste receptor. It's not clear which one is doing it. And they don't know what the ligand is, so there's almost no studies on it. We have a project in the group to get the structures for these taste receptors associated with diseases, then to get really selective agonist antagonists. You can turn on or turn off each one of those receptors and figure out what they're doing and how they're related to disease. Now this one, it's the, the target's asthma. So, um, so, yeah, so we need, we need uh, better drugs for asthma. Um, and so, um, I guess I put this in here. Yeah, so taste, re so, so uh, receptors like dopamine receptor, opiate receptors, cannabinoid receptors, they're all, they're all um, serotonin receptors. They're always called class A. They're Rodolphin-like uh, molecules. They don't have much of an extracellular uh, uh, or intracellular piece. Um, and for, for, it used to be taste receptors were considered class A. There were no structures for them, so it wasn't clear how to actually compare them. But there are dramatic differences between the taste receptors. We've now predicted three of them, uh, and the class A GPCR. Very dramatic differences. Um, and so, so Steve Liggett at Florida had taken a, a target lichen, this one, um, and made a number of variations on it and measured the binding constant. Um, and then, and so we did our, our, we predicted the structure, and then we predicted using Darwin Doc, the binding site, and then we made the predictions from that based upon the, the binding energy. So these studies don't, don't, are not doing activation, we're just uh, calculating binding. Um, we found is that uh, about 12 of the ligands all have the same binding site, and they correlate pretty well with the measured uh, binding. Uh, lots of problems with the measured binding, lots of things can affect it, but they correlate pretty well. And then there are four cases, or maybe five, that have a different binding site that don't correlate so well. And so, um, so um, let's see, do I want to say something about this? Yeah, okay, yeah. So based on our binding site, we made a pharmacophore of what this best ligand, T5A, wanted to have. We wanted to have a hydrogen bonds in these positions, pi stacking at that position. And then based on that binding site, um, we made a pharmacophore that we could then use to test 160 million molecules. So again, so we do get a, a binding site, and then there is software that go very quickly through many molecules to see, is there a configuration of molecule, not using energy, is there a configuration of molecule that can, can recognize those, those six sites? And so, um, and so, and so, yeah. So, so we're doing, actually we finished now going through the first pass of this, uh, all 164 million. What we found is that um, actually the first group of 500,000 included the molecule T5A, and for that, the, the virtual screening software said that was the best out of these 500,000 molecules. Um, so that, but those, the in-circle methods aren't good for predicting the winners. 
Um, so we use our Darwin Duck method for predicting the winners. We found actually there were 737 um, that were, would be better than this. So uh, now we've gone through the full 368, 164 million uh, molecules in this database. We've now identified about um, 800, well, uh, 800 that should be binding better. Um, and now we're going through the process of picking the winners from this. We'll reduce it down to maybe five or six cases, and then we'll have Steve Leggett in Florida uh, measure the, uh, try these, these new cases experimentally. So what we try to do is do all the hard work with the theory, and then reduce it down to a very few cases for doing the experiment. Um, so I was hoping I'd have the results, but uh, they, they didn't arrive before I left this morning. So, so maybe by, by next Monday I'll have them. Uh, anyway, so uh, the other topic is on pain. So, you know, there's no good, pain's there to try to, so you don't do stupid things with your body, but uh, a lot of people suffer pain for no good reason. The problem is that their side effects are taking the current drugs for pain. Um, there's addiction problems, um, a, a number of other problems that are associated with it. And so we'd like to find uh, drugs that can relieve the pain but not have the side effects that morphine and other pain drugs have. So, um, so I, I was amazed. 115 die from overdoses every day. Um, um, so, um, so, so all the current pain medicines have potential problems with addiction. Uh, so, so what you so what you want to have is so there's two kinds of signaling that that the GPCRs can do. One's called G the G protein signaling, the GDP, GTP exchange, uh, that's the good one, that relieves the pain. But there's also what's called beta arrested signaling, and for many cases, that, cause, that causes the side effects that you don't want to have. You'd like to have ligands that don't do this, that only do this. And so those are called bias ligands. Um, and so there's not a drug in the market that's biased. They all have these potential side effects. Um, we did a project with, um, with um, a group in Korea uh, that can do the experiment uh, to find new bias ligands that would, might be good candidates. So this is um, just uh, in, in Korea. So basically, um, they came up with about 65,000 molecules they thought they could synthesize. They could do a synthesis in one to six months. So you don't want to do 65,000 that way. And so we did the the, 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 the docking uh, computationally of those 64,000. Um, and then after doing the virtual screening, we did optimization. And the idea was we'd come back and, and have only a few cases to do the experiments on. So one database had 64,000, another one had 4,000. Um, so we took um, the theory on this one, this predict six cases. Um, uh, five of them turned out, even though they said they could be synthesized or hard to synthesize, the one that could be synthesized worked sort of so-so. Um, and again, this one we uh, predicted six, and uh, one of them worked. So, so, that's, so, so that's using the, the virtual screening and using our methods to get the optimum binding site. So then we, uh, <clears throat> so the second round of, of sensing, we found some uh, Good candidates, um, and so then, um, and, w and we we had predicted this one, but this is easier to make. We showed it shouldn't be quite almost as good, and so uh, the experiments were done on this one. We did it, uh, so that worked, that one case. Then we did a new round of 500 new choices with our group screening, um, and then from this one, it turned out that 14 of them worked. All of them biased. None of them did the beta arrestin signaling. And two of them are in with binding constant of 175. They were tested on mice and they work. So what you do with mice to see if they, if you relieve the pain, you put them on a hot plate, and then if, if it's a good drug, the bad drug they jump up and down a lot because it hurts. The good drugs they don't jump up and down so much. So this is an, another example. Um, so um, so this one. Um, so we, we actually looked, the question is what makes it biased? Why is a binding site for morphine 
do both beta resin and G protein signaling, but this bias ligand only does the G protein. What we found is that uh, it seemed to be a correlation. So the ligands bind the outside, the beta resin uh, it binds the inside. So it's not clear how, how the effect on the outside is affecting the beta resin. What we found was that, um, that it looked like that the bias ligands break the 5 6 interaction. So there's an interaction between TM5 and 6. And so there's a correlation uh, in terms of the ones that seem to work and whether it has a 5 6 interaction. So, um, so, so anyway, so um, the net result is that we're able to um, get new agonists. They're all I, uh, um, biased. And uh, we published this uh, in Kim Med Kim. Um, and so, um, so just to summarize, we're doing these drug uh, development activities. There are four collaborations we had with experimental groups. Um, the CD Hope group, which can make, who can make the molecules. Uh, we now have a drug that's 190 times better than the one they started with. Um, and um, for the twist, the breast cancer, I don't know how to assess it, um, but it, we got 93% uh, wound closure compared to only 50% for the best drug. For the asthma, well, right now we're in the process, so maybe by next Monday I'll, I'll have an experimental hit, it's a computational hit. And then for the pain, we have, uh, got results and published. So here's the general strategy now that we have. So, so we look at, we take, for, we take a, a projected structure for the GPCR, 25 structures. We're looking for a ligand. We go through the 50,000 poses, reduce it down to the best 100, and finally pick one or two. Um, and then, uh, based on this docking to the target uh, of GPCR, we make a pharmacophore. We do in, screen, in silico screening. We can do uh, uh, tens of thousands pretty quickly. Right now, we're doing a case we're doing 164 million. That takes a little, it's just been taking over a month. Um, and now, we, to, then the question is how do we test it? Doing cell line tests is not so direct because lots of things can affect the binding to get the, the CEC50s you get from experiments. We have a collaboration with Judy Sue at, at, um, at Arizona. And when she was a graduate student at Caltech, she developed a very sensitive technique for measuring binding. So she can go down to, down to atom molar, and she'd do it directly for the receptor. She takes a GPCR, she mobilizes it onto her sensor, and she can look directly at binding to that. And so the idea is that if we take these cases, we may have uh, 50 good cases from the theory. We reduce it down to maybe six cases. She does experiments. Um, and then uh, if there are discrepancies, we try to resolve them. Um, and then if we pass any, if it passes these tests, then we have the collaboration with Steve Liggett at Florida, who does cell lines. And so, uh, so he can take the best cases from Arizona and test those. And then the idea is, if it works there, then we do the R group screening. So just like with the project with City of Hope, we go through and take a, a scaffold that worked, and modify a little side group, change this methyl to a sulfonyl, change that hydrogen to a uh, uh, to a methoxy or whatever. Um, and we'd use a theory to, to, and a predicted structure to assess a, the, our group screening. Um, and then, um, but now the problem is that now it's a new molecule. The 164, the 164 million were molecules you could actually order. So you didn't have to synthesize them. But now we're modifying those molecules. They won't generally be available. Then we have a collaboration with Barry. Brian Stoltz at Caltech, who have a graduate student make the molecules. And then he makes enough for Judy Sue to test experimentally. So he passes her test. Then he makes a little bit more for Steve Liggett to do it. So he passes his test. Then we go back and then do another round of our group screening um, to optimize the system. And, be, and, and then Brian Stoltz makes it. So we go through the cycle to get higher activity and selectivity, the same way we did with the project with Korea on pain. Um, so it's just an example of uh, Judy Sue's experiments using the flower technique, where she can measure down, as I said, to atom order. Uh, so I think, um, yeah. So two projects I'll, I'll talk a little more about on, on Monday. We have one against substance abuse. So it's been discovered that there's an orphan GPCR, no one knew what its function was, called 139. 
Um, but if you uh, agonize 139, you activate it. Um, and if at the same time you block dopamine two, uh, D2, D3 dopamine receptors. So the dopamine receptors are the ones that give you pleasure. You know, you, you, you got a faculty offer that you wanted, you feel really good about, that's dopamine. Um, and so the problem with dopamine is it makes you feel good about uh, relieving your pain, and you get hooked on that drug. Uh, that, um, and, and then uh, for pain, you have to keep using, increasing dose, dose, dosages, and you get hooked on it. So, so, but apparently for mice, if you agonize 139, and if you block or maybe uh, 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 antagonize D2 and D3, you can get um, cure substance abuse for mice. It's been tested on mice. So what we're going to do is find a, a new ligand that can do both. One ligand uh, agonizes 139. At the same time, it either antagonizes or is inverse agonist for the dopamine receptors. And so um, and then we'll test those new ligands with Judy Sue to make sure that it works in all three. Blocks these, agonizes those. Um, another project, uh, we did a project with NIH. Um, uh, 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 a serotonin 1E receptor that had no known function. And what the collaborator at, at NIH showed was that this protein with 450 amino acids, um, it binds to serotonin. It doesn't do G protein activity. It does beta restin. And the beta restin activity is neuroprotective. So, uh, so it actually uh, it potentially a very important uh, potential drug, except you don't want a drug based on 450 amino acids. You want a small molecule drug that does the same thing. So we're right now in the midst of doing, yeah, we're in the midst of doing um, um, in silico screening against our binding site. So we want to, the binding site involves uh, uh, six different salt bridges and hydrogen bond interaction. We want to replace the 450 amino acids uh, of the CPE with a small molecule drug. So. So that's ongoing. We won't have the results of that this next week. Uh, so I think, yeah. So people did the work. I hate these kind of slides. Uh, so the people did the work um, I talked about today, mostly Su Kyung Kim and Moon Young Yang, um, and also Amir Mafi. Um, and then the collaborators uh, in the project I just talked about, Steve Ligon of Florida, uh, Orrin and Glacken at City of Hope. Um, and uh, uh, Yang Chu Kim at uh, Just. And these are funded by a combination of uh, National Institutes of Health and also Global Foods. Um, so these are people who did most of this. I think I've left enough time to have a lot of discussion. Yeah, so I went kind of fast. Um, so, um, but um, the point is theory is not a position where it's predictive enough. We can get the structures we need for GPCRs pretty reliably. Pretty fast from theory. Uh, we can get maybe new structures in a week or two for the GPCRs. Um, depending upon how much in silico screening we're doing, so we get a GPCR structure. If there's a known ligand, we bind the, the ligand to it using Darwin Doc. Um, and then we take that binding site, use that binding site to get a pharmacophore. We can use that to go through in circle databases. We can use software like the phase from Schrodinger. Uh, to actually go through a large database, pick out winners. Uh, the encircle methods are not, I'm sorry, I should say to, to get rid of losers. Uh, encircle software is not good enough to pick the winners. We reduce it down to 1,000, a few thousand. We then do Darwin Doc to predict the binding sites. And then we try to reduce that down to five or six that we can actually do experiments on. So they do, let the theory do the hard work of going through large databases reducing it down to the few that have a really good chance to work. And then I collaborate with experimentalists to test them. Uh, a nice thing about our collaboration with Judy Sue at Arizona is she can do direct receptor ligand binding. So that's exactly what we're trying to design for. Uh, we have a, we're doing a project on COVID, and we did, we've picked three ligands. They're already FDA approved. They were FDA approved because you put a metal in these ligands, and they're, they're good for doing imaging. Take the metal out, uh, they bind to the RBD of the COVID-19, prevent it from to, to interact with, with the ACE2 receptor. So it worked great in the wild type, 2,000 times better. It only worked for two 
of the delta, and none of them work for the, COVID, the Omicron. So, so, so we're going to have a nice experimental paper. The three parts kind of weak because we, could, we don't know why uh, our designs didn't work for Omicron. Um, anyway, so but the point is that techniques are there where theory can actually be useful in designing new drugs. And so I think it's a, really a very promising time. Uh, the th needs are, um, so, so we use a special force field for our ensemble or structure prediction and for our uh, ligand prediction. It's called the Dryden force field, which has very good descriptions of, of, of uh, hydrogen bonds, much better than the standard bi biological force field. But uh, it's still not. Now we know, we understand about non-bond interactions. We know now that none of the force fields have a really great description of the non-bond well depths. So we're using, we're now in the process of developing a new generation of non-bond interactions and a new generation of electrostatic interactions where we include polarization and charge transfer, we think may be uh, more accurate. So using our energy-based approaches, they'll be more reliable. Right now, it works okay. We've had successes, but we have to think a lot about the various, various aspects of things. We, we're doing binding to a binding site. Uh, we'll, we'll, bind, we'll look at the binding energy, but we'll sometimes double or triple the electrostatic or double and triple the non-bond. And we compare those different measures to try to, try to, go to, try to improve the reliability. And so it takes way too much effort. If we could get better force fields, we could reduce that effort. And so we think we, we may be able to do that. So I think it's a, a time, so I think that if, in the future we can start seeing a lot of improvement. So mostly these days, drugs that are being developed experimentally, they only focus on the target. They're trying to get that really bind well to the target. But then they often find side effects because it doesn't just, just bind to the target, it binds to the other thing. So what you want to do instead for drug design is target anti target. You want to bind strongly to this target or, and to activate it. You don't want to bind to the dopamine and to these other anti-targets. And so computation, we can do that. Computation, we can set up a procedure. But at the same time, we're optimizing the target. We can see what's happening with the anti-targets. Experimentally, it's so much effort to do that. No one does it. So I think, I think there's a possibility. I'd say right now, in my mind, drug design is still in the Stone Age days. days. You know, People, the companies spend millions of dollars developing something, and then we put it in trials to find either it doesn't work very effectively or it has other side effects that are toxic. And so I think um, you know, we've really got to improve that process. I think a theory can really play a major role. So, so on Monday, next Monday, I'll talk about some of the details behind this and some of the other work we're doing on GPCRs, uh, more technical issues. Thank you. And speak up. You know, I, I have hearing hate is odd, but I, sometimes I have trouble understanding. Okay. Ha, huh. please go ahead. Sir? And, and I went pretty fast. I can go back through the slides if you want to catch up on this. Hello, sir. So is there any specificity in Darwin duck? How it is better than auto duck or uh, fish duck? So, so. Darwin duck. So he's asking what is so special about Darwin duck oh, compared to... Oh, it does to... very good for hydrogen bonds. So. So we developed uh, Dryden in 1984, um, and then we used it in an earlier software we developed uh, called Bio, uh, very software, published in 1990, and we use a, 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 a three-body hydrogen bond interaction to do very well for hydrogen bonds. So the standard force fields which are pretty good overall, um, uh, charm and amber, uh, have very simplified hydrogen bond interactions, which is really important is getting hydrogen bonds between residues on different backbones. Um, and so combination of the hydrogen bonding and, and our, what we call the scream technique for optimizing side chains make, makes, it, makes it good. But uh, we now know that the non-bond interactions we use and the non-bond interactions in Charm and Ember, none of them are really all that good. So we're going to try to improve that part of it. And then um, we, over the last uh, couple of years, we developed much more accurate way of doing electrostatics, where we allow charge transfer um, to be based on uh, electronegativity and other properties. And we also allow polarization at every atom. Uh, so we use a, 
description of, of electrostatics, instead of using point charges, we use Gaussian functions to size the atom, and we allow polarization by allowing the electron charge to be displaced to the positive charge. So it's a much more accurate interaction. And so it may not be practical, the, 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 the GPCRs I talked about here, uh, simulations are about 100,000 atoms, and in double GPCRs, like the Class C, about 500,000 atoms. It may not be practical to do very accurate uh, 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 electrostatics for the whole time, but we can actually do it every so often to improve the electrostatics. So I think we can improve the electrostatics, improve the non-bonding, and then uh, we have a general hydrogen bond interaction we think is maybe even better than driving. It's the non-bond interactions that are really important. And we'd like to make it automatic enough that you don't have to understand it too well to get the right answer. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much. Uh, as an outsider, I, I had a general question. Uh, you hear, uh, and you mentioned the Stone Age, so I was wondering uh, what the next stage is going to bring us. So in particular, uh, one hears about uh, quantum simulations getting better with, uh, 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 with uh, quantum computation. Yeah, so Do you think that's uh, well, on the horizon? I, I, I think it's good to work on it. I think quantum computing will have a really big effect on security. Uh, but I think in terms of doing at atomistic simulations, um, I think that you know the current, uh, I haven't kept track, but uh, maybe, maybe they're up to 100 qubits or so. Um, so. So you can do maybe quantum mechanics very accurately on small systems. But we want to do these applications here. We need to do predictions on a, you know 100,000 atoms. And we need to get good interactions. And so, so on, on um, I think on the, the 19th, I give a talk on what we're doing with batteries and fuel cells and electrocatalysis. There we use uh, quantum mechanics methods. Uh, but again, we need to do quantum mechanics. So right now, the limitation of quantum mechanics is we can do pretty accurate calculations uh, at, the, at the level of two or 300 atoms. And that's about the limit. We can do pretty accurate quantum mechanics dynamics on maybe 20, 40, 60 picoseconds. And so, so on materials problems like batteries and fuel cells, the problem is going to be so the quantum mechanics is useful for model systems. But for practical systems, we need to have maybe 100,000 atoms. And I'm not going to do, I don't think we'll be doing highly accurate quantum mechanics when I retire in 15 years. So I think right now we have to have methods, and I'll talk about them on the 19th, of going beyond quantum mechanics to do reactions. I, but don't get me wrong, I think the quantum computing is really worthwhile studying and pushing yeah, on, yeah, but and seeing where, how far you can go. Yeah. And, um, the, the, the methods of doing ab initio quantum mechanics, I mean, they're, they're pretty good. We can do systems with maybe 50 atoms pretty accurately now. And, and so, 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 so quantum, compu quantum computing is important, but it's not going to solve my problems, mm -hmm. I think. Way in the back. Oh, OK. Yell out. I, 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 uh, just in addition of what do you think about the, uh, yeah, the new methods, the new, new hype, machine learning, the, the Google machine, which can... Yeah, so we do a little bit of that. I, so I've been sort of a skeptic. I think machine learning is overplayed, and uh, artificial intelligence is overplayed. A lot of sample cases earlier were, I think, more trivial cases. But we, we're actually using machine learning combined with our methods, for some, not in the application I mentioned here, but possibly. So I told, said we do 13 trillion structures. We throw all that information away to get the best thousand. We throw all that information away and talk about the best one or two. No doubt there's a lot of useful information that if we could analyze, we might get much better understanding of what's going on with all these structures. And so we have, we, have some, we have several projects trying to find um, and, and, uh, the force fields we use. Um, they're all uh, objective force fields. You know, we have non-bond interactions, electrostatic interactions, things we understand. Um, and so, but we have problems where uh, that, where, where we don't get the accuracy we want, and we're trying to use machine learning approaches to improve the force fields. 
The trade-off is we don't necessarily understand exactly what it's doing with all interactions. I like understanding, here's what my non-bonding interaction looks like as I, as I change the distances. Or my electrostatics, I like to understand what's actually underneath these two. The downside of machine learning is I may not get a model I can use to think with. And then I have to worry, machine learning, uh, the training set that I use, how valid would this model be outside of that training set? How do I judge where the limits are? But yeah, we're working on techniques. I, I'll, I so talk about some on, on, uh, on the, um, we, for some of the electric catalysis stuff. But I thought that there is also a technical issue, meaning these uh, deep, I don't, deep mind or whatever, the Google machine is, 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 is good in, in predicting protein structures, you know, sort of, um, of, yeah, which have, well, okay, so along that line. But, but so. binding, but binding, finding binding signs or binding configuration is something that has not been solved yet. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's actually been a lot of play but recently. The AlphaFold 2 has made protein structure predictions for lots and lots of proteins. And they may be pretty good. We tested them for a GPCR, a taste receptor. There are no known experimental structures. They had no data input. Um, and for the... Uh, 2R14 taste receptor, we had a collaboration with Steve Liggett at, at, at Florida. He tested our, our predictions by doing mutations that could make one case go worse, another case go better, and it passed that test. And the alpha fold was just completely off. So, but they had no data. Maybe with our data, they'll do better, better than we could do, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, the, the problem is, for me, just under, so I know how to think about physical interactions and, and know how to, to get judgment about it. But I'm worried about things that are buried behind the uh, different layers of neural networks, the understanding what's, what's actually, what's the, what is, what's the domain of, uh, of reliability? Uh, I think that's, that's the issue. But yeah, we're, we're working on several machine learning related projects. Uh, one of them is related to directed evolution. So Francis Arnold at Caltech has been very successful of doing letting evolution optimize systems. But the problem with it is that if you have amino acid with 400 residues, to do maybe more than four sites, it takes a lot of effort. So we're trying to develop techniques we can choose the best sites for her to do the mutations on. And there, uh, we're using some really machine learning approaches. We'll see how it works out. It's, but it's machine learning mixed with physical re reasoning. So not pure. You have to speak loud. I think it's not on. So, uh, sir, my question is regarding the selectivity. Uh, how are you selecting the threshold value uh, for reducing the number from 13, 16 trillion to something um, like by a huge factor? So, he's asking the threshold value, the uh, reducing from 13 trillion. Ah, to, are you uh, selecting the threshold value? Sure. Okay. So you select the threshold. So I'll talk a little more detail on next Monday, but um, there's actually two stages. Um, one stage we take tilts from either theory or experiment, uh, and we only rotate about the axes. And we've shown is that if we rotate every 30 degrees, um, that we can pretty well sample the space with fixed tilts. We can pretty well sample the space. That's 35 million structures, and then we. Uh, the, from those 35 million structures, we do pairwise interactions with the helices. Uh, we optimize the side chains for each pair. That's a mean field approach. Uh, and then we find is that if we build the best uh, 1,000 structures, that if we do, do this on a known structure, number one is almost always the known structure. That says the energy scaling is good. It's a little more complicated when we have tilts because then we're comparing structures where we have different tilts between them. So it's not quite so straightforward how to do it. I didn't think it would be possible, but graduate student and postdoc figured out how to do that. And so what we do is we do all the pairwise interactions, but now we have to combine them in a more complicated way because the different structures have different tilts. And so, um, so, uh, so it's, but it's again a mean field approach. The fundamental information uh, has to do with uh, different pairs of helices interacting. Um, and so we go through the 13, we evaluate all 13 trillion structures energetically using a mean field approach. 
we reduce it down again to 1,000 or 2,000. We pack it into a bundle then. And we pack it in a bundle, we re-predict the side chains. So we have a very good way of predicting side chain confirmation, pairs pairwise, called SCREAM. And then uh, the, those 1,000, uh, then um, for the, that generally has the best structures as number one or number two or number three. So that, that's the, how we go from 13 trillion. It's a hierarchy. Do low-level computations on 13 trillion, high level on 1,000 or 2,000. And then, then we focus on the, the best few of them to, to, to tr make a final decision. That answers your question. I have one more question. So, Go ahead. Um, with that, you have said that uh, we have taste receptors all over our body. You so have to speak loud. I cannot hear you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, you said that we have taste receptor all over our body, right, in, m in different places. So my question is, why don't we feel taste uh, in GI tract or any other places apart from our tongue? So he's asking that you mentioned that you have, we have taste receptor throughout our body, but we feel the taste only in the tongue. Well, so you, yeah, the, the, so people think that the function of the bitter taste receptors, we also work on sweet receptors. So, uh, but the bitter taste receptors are 25 in your body. Uh, people think that may, mainly they were to avoid eating things that would be bad for you. Uh, and so that may be partly true and partly not true. But, um, but um, the, the, there's taste receptors in, your, in, the, in the GI tract. And for example, one of them, TR38, it plays a role of modulating GOP, which controls obesity um, and, um, and diabetes. And so. So they've, they've been able to have a collaborator. We did some predictions on this. They've been able to figure, take our predicted um, agonists for that system and shown that those agonists uh, actually control GLP release. But mostly, no one knows what they're doing. So, uh, except uh, there are known diseases associated with taste receptors. They're just not sure what's gone wrong. What is the endogenous ligand that activates them? And, and the cases that have gone wrong associated with diseases, again, they're lungs, the brain, the heart, a GI tract, all over your body. Mostly people don't know what they do. I mean, so our project, uh, we, we just found out we didn't get funded, but <laughs> we'll try again. Uh, our project there is to take uh, taste receptors that are associated with disease and then optimize ligands that can bind low nanomolar binding to activate and low nanomolar binding to, to, uh, to keep inactive. And the idea there is if we have uh, a ligand that could turn on or turn off each one of the re uh, taste receptors, and most organs don't have just one. They may have two or three or four. Um, uh, then we could do experiments where you turn on and turn off the different taste receptors and see what they're actually doing. And then for cases that are associated with disease, see what, what aspect of the disease they're playing a role in. So that's, that's the idea there. So, um, does that mean that I was thinking that by taste, you uh, like uh, I was subsetting the the number, the thing that we uh, just uh, just uh, get to sense through our tongue. So by taste, you mean to say that um, a broader aspect of different sort of other uh, functions that goes on in our body. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, I was okay. Uh, should I rephrase my question? Uh, maybe you can talk to him. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, or high tea. <coughs> uh, any uh, further? Uh, we, last we have more time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you have another? Uh -huh, no, let me ask. I get, yeah. So these uh, GPCR proteins are present in bilayer uh, membrane of the lipid. So the lipid composition of different organelles are different. So does that affect the conformation of GPCR that are present in that organelles? It could be. So the more recent calculations, uh, so you know, so there's cholesterol in, in the membrane, about one cholesterol per seven uh, lipids. And um, we did a project I didn't talk about having to do with migration of molecules through the, through the membrane. And we discovered 
that the cholesterol actually plays in a role in the migration rate. Uh, and so, um, and the, the cholesterol actually plays a role in the fluidity. So it could be that, um, that it will control how easily the GPCR can adapt to a new configuration. Mostly, we ignore that so far. Um, and so, yeah, so I think right now, we're on the threshold of getting results that can have impact, that is, it can play a role in dev developing new drugs. There's lots and lots of work to do. This is, not, this is only the beginning. Uh, but I think we're far enough along, we've been successful with several experimental collaborations where we can do iterating back and forth, because uh, experiments take time. So we can do lots of, uh, lots of experiments computationally, and try to reduce it down to the best ones. And most, mostly so far, you know, we predict maybe five or six, and maybe one or two work out to actually be much better. And so right now we're not following up where we went wrong with the three or four that didn't were, were better. That, that's information that would be useful. Um, so um, yeah, so yeah, so so I think I think it's it's a, I think we've passed a threshold where it's good enough to be useful, but by mo no means. Uh, is it is it it's straight on for everything? There's many factors we're still not including. One last question. Yeah. Validation. You have done sometimes four nanosecond MD and sometimes twenty four nanosecond MD. So what decides that length of the trajectory? To so I didn't talk today. I'll talk more next Monday. So when we do dynamics, we generally so the problem is the barriers are high, and so regular dynamics may never cost the barrier, and so. So we generally, for example, opening up the, so I said that this G protein is, is closed, and the, and the process activation is opening it up to release the GDP. So looking for barriers like that, the regular dynamics may not ever find it. So we do matter dynamics where we'll have a starting point, it's closed, and at any point it's open, and then we'll go back and forth um, from the closed to the open. Uh, maybe we have two or three, uh, the, Variables were falling from closed to open, and then, um, and then we we assess. Um, so so as, so there's well depths, and so every so often you add a, a little Gaussian to raise up the floor of the well, and another Gaussian to raise up the floor. And if you add enough Gaussians, you raise up the floor high enough, you can cross the transition states often enough to get sampling of the transition state. And then you can take these Gaussians you added, subtract them back off, and then you get the free energy surface. For that those rare processes. So we use that kind of technique over and over again in all these simulations I talked about. Regular dynamics is not generally good enough. To, it's good, if you start with a con stable configuration, it's good enough to, to iterate on a stable configuration, but not necessarily good enough to, to activate the system or go to some new, some new structure. So, um, so we do metadynamics for all of that. And uh, then the issue of metadynamics is when have you converged? And so, so, so we have various ways of trying to assess that we've converged. And typically, um, it takes between half a mi microsecond and 1.5 microseconds for some of these systems to get a good convergence. Uh, so that, um, uh, that's the way it is right now. I don't, I've forgotten who asked it. Right, okay, yeah. So, so again, I think that we're by, by no means at the end of the story here, but I think we've gotten far enough along that we're actually having an impact. So that was the message I want to give today. And then I'm, next Monday, I'm going to talk a little more about details of GPCRs um, and some, of the, some more of the details about the techniques. OK, last question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there are many GPCRs in our body. OK, uh, so I mean, uh, how, I mean, the ligand, I mean, which is there, uh, I mean, there are many ligands, kinds of ligands. So one ligand corresponds to one GPCR or uh, yeah. like, one-to-one so, one or, I so, mean, many ligands So a typical project, yeah. uh, our first step is to get the structure of GPCR. Almost never is it one available. And so, 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 so our techniques are pretty, pretty good for that. Um, again, going into 13 trillion and going down, it just works out pretty well. And again, we, we don't get one structure. We get 25. We think represents the, 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 the range of structures that could be thermally stable. Um, and when we do our docking, uh, we, we take uh, 10 or 15 confirmations, so stable confirmations, uh, and individually dock each one of those 15, 10 or 15, to each one of the 25. 
And some confirmations may want G protein structure A, some may prefer B, just because of the, uh, the, the changes in the confirmation. And so, uh, so the downside of that is we can't really do that and put all the solvent in. So we do that dry. Um, and we also, um, so, um, yeah, so, um, but, um, I forget, so, anyway, so that, that's the, the, the procedure. Um, and so, uh, means, again, so, the, the total problem is completely impossible. So we try to break it into pieces that are possible, and then put those pieces together to actually get a, sto a story together. And so, uh, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, the really key thing that's happened over the last couple of years is we've been able to get good collaborations and experiments to actually test the predictions. Uh, and so, um, you know, the thing is, if you're not collaborating with the experimentalists, they're always busy doing something else. So for these collaborations, you know, it's, it's, we work hand in hand. And we've been successful enough, they're willing to do the test. Um, so the first round was the pain, pain one we started uh, several years ago. And that one, um, we made our six predictions, and then without telling us, um, they made some modifications because it's hard to do the synthesis. Even though it's supposed to be easy to synthesize, they made little modifications. For the first round, I made six predictions. And then my colleague at, at GIST in Korea said, well, Bill, none of them work. And so then I went to talk about it. Well, we made a little change here, and we made a little change there. So I took the, the, one, the ones he changed, and sure enough, they wouldn't have worked. So we could have told him that. Uh, so now the rule is they make, you know, we agree on exactly which ones we're going we're gonna to do. And, uh, and even then, uh, so we, uh, we predicted 64. 20 of them were better, would look, look like they'd be better than the, 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 the starting function. But, um, so, um, but you know, it's still the, the, reli the reliability is good, but not perfect. So, uh, so we, we like to go through this back and forth. So why, why did our prediction not work? Well, maybe in the dynamics, uh, you know, the fluctuations in the structures and stuff. So. Uh, but it's a, it's a practical approach right now. We can do these things fast enough. We can, we can do our end of it. It's experience is a slow part. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I think, you know, the thing about it is that, um, that I think theory is getting to a point where it can start to be really useful. It's already been at a useful point. Every drug company has theorists uh, helping them do the, do the development. The company I started 30 years ago, Schrodinger's, got a really good market there. They've been very useful. They're getting techniques that they, that they find reliable. So that, that's all good. But the number of successes from using the theory is not as high as I'd like for it to be. And so uh, I think that, um, that there are improvements in the methods uh, that, we, that we've developed that, that uh, will be important. OK, so yeah. thanks, Will, uh, for an amazing story. Uh, thank you once again. I'd like to give it to Rajesh for... Uh... Yeah, no, thank you very much uh, for a very illuminating talk.